Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Live Coffee Talk. Happy Wednesday. Um, this is a show where I bring you love, courage, and connection. And joining me this morning is a very special guest. I have Warwick Fairfax here today with me, and he is the founder of Crucible Leadership, a philosophical and practical breakthrough in turning business and personal failure into a fuel of igniting a life of significance. His personal and professional journey has opened a door for both men and women from all walks of life to not only bounce back from failure, but to also become the leaders they were born to be. Fairfax holds an undergrad degree in philosophy, politics, and economic from Oxford University and earned MBA from Harvard Business School. He is an international coach Federation Certified Executive Coach. He is an elder at Bay Area Community Church. And if you're looking for him, chances are good that you can find him on his podcast at Beyond the Crucible, where he shares the insight from his personal experience and interview others who have leveraged their crucible moment to live and lead with significance. So joining me and welcome, Warwick Fairfax. We were, you know, what's called old money. Um, if this was the U.S., it might be, I don't know, uh, you know, Rockefellers, Vanderbilts, or, you know, I suppose uh, Bush, Kennedy. I mean, you know, just sort of old money family. Uh, so, you, could, you know, getting into exclusive clubs, it was, none of that was a problem. So it wasn't, it was money, power, prestige, status, respect. All of those things were there. Um so by the time I came along, I was expected by my parents to go into the family media business, sort of a duty was a big thing in our family. And so I never even questioned that I shouldn't go in there because to not go in there would be betraying my parents and my family, my ancestors. It's like, it was unthinkable not to go in there because I love my family and you just don't do things like that, you know, let them down. Mm -hmm. So I prepared most of my life to go in there, uh, went to Oxford, like my dad and some other relatives, worked on Wall Street, have a business school. Not all because, oh, I liked finance or business. Um, it was more of those are the skills that were needed. Uh, my dad died in his late 80s and early 87. For a variety of reasons, I, I and my parents felt like the company wasn't being well run. So I launched a, a $2.25 billion Australian takeover to change management, bring the company back to the ideals of the founder. And things went wrong right from the beginning. Family sold out, October 87 stock market crash. We ended up having too much debt. And within three years, the company went under. So, um, I mean, it was sold to other folks, but a 150 year old uh, company left family hand. So that was sort of my crucible, so to speak. I'd wanted to do something that in my naivety in my twenties, I thought was noble, but ended up causing uh, a lot of damage to relationships. And um, I mean, obviously I probably notionally lost hundreds of millions on paper. I mean, we're still very comfortable and extremely blessed, but um, yeah, I mean, back to your question about money and, and power, it's um, money is never in itself, it's never been that much of an attraction for me. I mean, I like nice things and vacations and all, but, uh, you know, my parents that have people visiting from Hollywood, you know, whether it's Kirk Douglas, Liberace, and they would come and it's like, they were used to Hollywood parties, but the parties my mother threw almost felt like another level than they were used to, which is saying something she was, mm -hmm. she was quite... She was quite something, uh, my mother. So you had people who were very successful, but I wonder how many of them are, are happy. You know, they're trying to, you know, tell each other how successful they are and how wonderful. And it's just, I just got tired of the conversation. I mean, mm -hmm. be real. I, I'm tired. Don't tell me how wonderful and successful you are. I mean, so it just, it was kind of empty. So money, nothing wrong with money, but it doesn't tend to make people happy in of itself at least in my experience. Yeah. And, and I think um, what, what came up for me just now was that there, there was a lot of, you know, fame, what, what people attach to as being famous and being successful in life 
and now here you are sold the family company and and what was it like to to be in a two different status it's a complete two different status was people around you treating you differently well i mean i i married an american girl who i met in australia so we moved to the u.s in you know early 90s but um yeah, I mean, uh, certainly when I was growing up and you had advisors, yeah, there were definitely people that were like, oh, you know, you could be uh, one of the great Fairfaxes. And, you know, it's funny, you know, date, I, I never really dated any Australian girls because I was afraid that they would just, you know, like, want to pretend to like me for my money. So it's funny. It's kind of, yeah, I haven't, didn't date that much before my wife, but they were never Australian. So that tells you something. It's like all paranoid there. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Americans, it's like, what is Australia? You know, kangaroos, opera house. Yeah, you know, they've never heard of Fairfax Media, which, which was great, you know? Uh, so yeah, a little paranoid about relationships. But I always wanted to live a more of a normal life. You know, there was a time in which, you know, I was on the news all the time and I'd be in a shopping mall and people could actually recognize me. I mean, not anymore, but there was a time. Um, it's like, I, I, I never really wanted that. I didn't want fame or any of that kind of thing. So, yeah. You kind of just inherited. And, and well, it yeah. It wasn't a Pretty choice. much. Yeah, it wasn't no, a choice. I, I didn't feel like it was a choice, at least not with my kind of thinking of duty. Yeah. And, and so you were born in Australia? Was that? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. so when did you move to here in U.S.? So I moved, we ended up in Maryland, uh, like the early 90s, like, I don't know, late, uh, probably 91. So I've lived here a long time. All my kids are born here. But uh, yeah, my life is very different. Most people here, obviously, they didn't know me back then. And so yeah, my, my kids, uh, we go back to Australia fairly often, but it's hard for them to fully understand how I grew up because they didn't grow up that way. They grew up in a more normal environment. They didn't grow up with these massive expectations of you got to go into family business. I just want them to be happy. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't really have, that's really my new goal for my kids. So yeah, my life is very different as my kid's life. Which yeah. is do, do you raise them as, you know what, you, you, you got to earn what you, what you uh, ask. I try, I try. I mean, I'm not one of these people that, you know, like, um, uh, some people are very tough in parenting and, you know, you've got to uh, earn everything you do. But um, yeah, I mean, I try to help them be responsible. They're all in their twenties and mm -hmm. yeah, they all work hard and uh, they don't, you know, try to get flashy things. Not that they have mm -hmm. the wherewithal to do that, but yeah, they're all pretty grounded and uh, yeah, good values. So uh, yeah, I try to teach them. It's uh, I don't want them to have a silver spoon mentality, which, you know, they don't, mm -hmm. fortunately. Yeah, one. I think one of the terms that it came up twice was the term "normal." So, yes. what, what's your definition of normal? <laughs> <laughs> well, I know, I know for you, not normal is an interesting. Well, I guess something that's different than the way I grew up. You know, um, there was a, a, a lack of authenticity. You know, sort of the beautiful people. You know, the people that you know you kind of pretend to pay rapt attention to somebody even though you think they're immensely boring because they could help you in your career, you pretend that you're really interested. That's part of the game in, you know, the beautiful people, the, the successful having friendships based on what they can do for you, not because you like them. You might detest them, but if they can help you in your career, I'm not against networking, mm -hmm. but to have your whole life be a series of inauthentic relationships just to get ahead. I mean, to me, what is normal? I guess what I was looking for in normal is just a normal family. My dad was married three times, my mother twice. I didn't want that. I'm blessed to be married to my wife over 30 years. So that's probably not normal in this day and age. But for me, maybe normal is the wrong word, but I wanted kids to grow up to be, you know, uh, have self-worth, to do what made them happy, to have a good marriage, to have friends that like me for who I am, not because of what I can do for them. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe normal is the wrong word, but when I was growing up, that's what I was thinking. I just, I didn't want the power and the glitz. I just wanted real, maybe real is a better word, real friends, real family. Um, yeah, I, I didn't want any of the inauthentic, unreal glitz. That's just, uh, that's not satisfying. It's just, 
it's sort of, I don't know, it's sort of almost like eating a bunch of dessert and getting a sugar high. I mean, it tastes good at first, but then there's the after effects. I don't want any of those after effects. So yeah. I don't that makes sense at all, but. Yeah, what I, what I hear is actually the word genuine. Yes. Being genuine, yeah. Yeah. And, and I think genuine is really how we build relationship, right? No matter what status you're in, you know, I see mm-hmm. you and I, I actually see you person mm-hmm. to person and human to human. And, and I think, you know, being normal, um, there's nothing normal about our life. <laughs> That's just my opinion. So true. No, you're, no, you're right. I mean, just having genuine friendships, um, you know, being friends with somebody because you want to be, not because they can do something for you, just because you like who they are or they're the interesting people. And um, mm-hmm. yeah, we're just genuine, authentic. Those are the kind of relationships to me that have value. I mean, who wants to be friends with somebody when it's like, do you want to be friends with me because you like me or because I can do something for you? I mean, who I, wants I like to, to be that your friend? I like to be your friend because you have a big heart. And I know you have a big heart <laughs> just from the conversation that we had in, a, in, you know, during your podcast. And it was just, wow. it touches me. Well, thank and you. So I'm really curious, how did you, how did you get started in founding the uh, Crucible Leadership? Well, that? you know, um, for me, I guess every Crucible is different. I mean, uh, you know, mine was just growing up in a, a big family business and, and losing it and feel, felt like I'd let my family down. And because I'm a person of faith, I felt like, well, maybe God had a plan to bring some values back or at least with the founder. Uh, so I felt like I, I sort of blew it on, on so many different levels. So after that, it's like, well, well, now what do I do? I mean, it took most of the 90s, I was, I would say depressed, but in some ways, I just, you know, how, how do I find a sense of self-worth and meaning and purpose? I thought my purpose was Fairfax Media and all, and it's gone. And so, um, you know, as I did a number of things, including coaching, I came to think, well, maybe I can use my story in a way to um, to help others who've gone through crucible experiences and on my podcast and you know we've had everybody from people who've had physical challenges including a you know navy seal that became a paraplegic through um, parachuting accidents somebody that had early onset parkinson's to abuse to um, you know all manner of different challenges very, very different than mine. I don't, I don't have any of those challenges. But for me, crucibles is you go through an experience in which who you are afterwards is different. You'll never be the same person. It's a transformative experience. And, you know, it's often not pleasant. It's often painful physically, emotionally, spiritually. And so um, you can either, from my perspective, hide under the covers and be bitter and angry either at the universe, God, other people, yourself, and say, look, I, I've had it, I'm angry, I'm bitter, and I'm just checking out. Or you can say, that was awful, that was painful, I wouldn't wish that on anybody else, but how can I use this, Maybe if it's my own mistakes, how can I learn from that? If it's something that had nothing to do with anything I did, how can I use that to help others? Somehow when you can, and this is not my phrase, but when you can use your pain for a purpose, I don't know that it makes the physical challenges any less or in my case, it it probably does help uh, certainly emotionally deal with what I went through. But when you're using your pain for a purpose to help others, it gives life meaning. And so to me, I often talk about a life of significance, um, a life on purpose dedicated to helping others. When you do that, that's something that money or fame can't get. There's a sense, there's a sense of immense satisfaction when you help another soul, another individual, even in some small way. So to me, that's, that's, that's something, there's no sugar high there. That's something that it, it lasts. It gives your life meaning. And so that's kind of what I do both in, in my writings and mm-hmm. I'm going to have a book uh, that's coming out sometime next year uh, on crucible leadership. Uh, you know, a lot of stories, including my own about how you kind of get through tragedy and crucible. So that's kind of what I do is help others, you know, determine what the crucibles are and then help them figure out, well, what is the life of significance, a life on purpose, a life of meaning. Mm-hmm. And that'll be very different for every person. Yeah. 
there, there's a couple of points that you know I really wanted to point out is that you not only have personally experienced that crucible moment, you you actually came to um, finding your purpose. And and I apologize for my cat. That was my cat wanted to be on the camera. <laughs> It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> and so not only did you have that personal experience, but now you realize that this is something that you were gifted to help others. My, my curiosity and so curiosity, why do you think we all go through that crucible moment? Because all these interviewers that came onto your show that we all experienced some type of crucible moment experience. Why do you think we experience those? You know, I think many do. I mean, they don't have to be on some massive cosmic scale in the sense of a huge mm -hmm. business failure or huge uh, personal tragedy. But, um, you know, you can't be human without going through challenges. It could be a marital challenge. It could be with parents. It could be at work. I mean, one of the things I tell my kids and they're all in their twenties, don't expect to have a good boss. If you do be grateful, but, <laughs> most bosses aren't necessarily that good. They're concerned with the bottom line, with the numbers, and they might often think people are expendable and, you know, hey, you know, if you've got something going on in your life, well, sorry, if I can get rid of you without causing some lawsuit, I probably will because, hey, it's all about me and my success. And, and so that's, so, you know, it may not be on a massive cosmic scale, but we all go through challenges. Life is not easy. And certainly in the era of COVID-19 and, you know, there's immense division within our country and there's a lot of stress, a lot of pressure, a lot of anxiety. So people may not think of them as a massive crucible experience, but we all go through challenges in which we feel down or I don't know where to go or what to do. And um, so, you know, they're not all, you know, life-threatening physical, emotional tragedies, but it's mm -hmm. hard to be alive without going through challenges. It really, you know, even a mini crucible, and maybe that's a bad word, is something where it kind of knocks you off your game, knocks you off your feet. And it's like, you get fearful, you get anxious, you're not quite sure what to do next. Well, that's a sign that something's going on. Yeah. What, what was the biggest challenge for you? Was it the emotional challenge that you had mentioned? Yeah, I mean, while, you know, we weren't on the streets, so we were comfortable, not at the same level, but, you know, money is not because I saw that it, you know, it's not wrong, but in itself, it doesn't make you happy. That wasn't the biggest challenge. It was really feeling like I let my dad down, who I dearly love, my family. I'm, I'm not somebody that likes to hurt people. And so when I felt like my actions, even though it wasn't my intention, at least not consciously, to hurt people, there'd been friction within the family and other family members that throw my dad out as chairman. So subconsciously, yeah, I probably didn't like that, <laughs> you know, very loyal to my dad, but that's another story. But yeah, if it's feeling like I let my dad down and in some strange, maybe incorrect way, let God down, it was more the emotional and the spiritual that, um, and just a sense of aimlessness, like wandering in the desert, like, what do I do now with my life? You know, mm -hmm. and everything I touch, I screw up. I mean, my sense of self-worth was like rock bottom. You would think you have an Oxford degree and a Harvard Business School degree. Yeah, but look what I did, you know, like a, as big a failure. I mean, not too many people fail in, in the billions, you know, <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a massive, at least financial failure. So it just, I felt like a failure, you know, so that it was the emotional and the spiritual that was the toughest. Mm -hmm. they, they, may, they may not appear to be failing, but a lot of them, maybe they're failing in size. And, and we yeah. don't know, we can't tell from the inside, right? So exactly. people may have like a great degree, high, high position, but deep down inside, they're, they're failing somewhere. And, and right. I think I mean, that's, yeah. I mean, sometimes you could have successful executives and, you know, men or women, they're spending, you know, 100 hours a week or some massive time and they ignore their family. This is normal, so to speak, in that arena. And so the kids grow up and they may be on drugs or they kind of hanging out with the wrong crowd. They have no relationship with them. And, you know, uh, are they gonna feel like a failure? In some sense, yeah, I'm successful, but at what cost, you know? So uh, sometimes on their deathbed, they're thinking, gosh, I really messed up. And it's like, well, it's too late now, you know? So yeah, you don't want to be that person. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of people that experience failure, even successful people. Yeah. What, what was the, uh, how did you come out of that feeling of 
um, such a big failure. I don't have any self worth. What was? How did you come out of it? Well, you know, even with faith, I got to admit um, it was pretty tough. But the sense from my faith perspective that God loves us all unconditionally. He doesn't need our stuff. He doesn't need our achievements. Not that it's it's not wrong to want to achieve, but he loves us all just because we're human beings. I think inherently we all have worth and value. At least that's my kind of spiritual perspective. So that helped, but also having a wife that loved me for who I was. And, you know, she didn't love me. It wasn't because of money or anything else like that. So just that unconditional love. There was, there was never any of you're a failure and how could you do this? And some spouses can go there, but mine didn't. I and mean, she's an amazing person having, kids also that sort of that unconditional love and gradually finding things i could do and not mess up you know starting doing some business and financial analysis for an aviation services firm and then coaching and being on two nonprofit boards i began to find i'm not a rupert murdoch teach no prisoners kind of person but reflective advising being on boards coaching i found there were things i could do and do well and I got respect. I have to say money didn't matter that much to me. Respect. I did want respect. I have to say that was still is very important to me. And, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, who doesn't want to be respected, but certainly was important to me. So gradually I found things in which I did get respect and I could do well, but it, <clears throat> you know, it's a journey. I mean, finding that is not like a, you know, a, um, a five minute deal. It took years to find my path, but gradually, combination of those factors, the spiritual, the family, and finding things I could do and do well and be respected for, they all helped immensely. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that, you know, I had mentioned this earlier is that you are a person with big heart. And I can hear that as you're describing the unconditional love. So what is, what is love? Well, how do you define love? What a good question. To me, true love is, is unconditional love. True love is putting the other person's interest first. It's almost sacrificial love. They talk about, you know, servant leadership. True love is um, caring for somebody, not because they can do anything for you, but just because you feel called or you feel led. That is, that is true love to me is um, unconditional, no strings attached. When it's, you have the other person's best interest at heart, that is, that is true love to me. Yeah. How do you apply the true love to yourself? <laughs> that's, that's not, it's a lot easier to love other people at times than myself. I guess I'm pretty hard on myself. I try to, I'm a huge believer in forgiveness because um, bitterness erodes your soul. Even if somebody else wronged you mm -hmm. um, and justifiably they should be, you know, they should be held accountable and et cetera. Bitterness, it just tends to destroy you, typically not the other people. So part of it is forgiving myself for my mistakes. I mean, I was, after all, in my 20s. I was young, naive. I didn't consciously try and hurt anybody. I just was young, idealistic. Um, I just made some colossally dumb mistakes that were very public. So it's like, okay, give yourself a break. And so I'd say I've done a reasonably good job over the years of, of just forgiving myself and, and not being too tough on myself. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And just realize I'm not perfect. Who is, but you know, I mean, I've got friends, wife, kids that kind of love me unconditionally and that obviously must mean something. I mean, they're intelligent people. And, um, so yeah, I think it's, it's hard to sort of love yourself, but I think realizing you have worth and forgiving yourself for the mistakes that you make, uh, that's, I think that's part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I've heard so, you've learned so much from your journey. It was a long process coming to where you are now and realizing that you're recognizing your self-worth and recognizing that you, you can be a little too harsh on yourself. Um, and, and that doesn't, that doesn't come easy. Well, having that no, I think the other thing is we're often, I know we've talked about it on the podcast, when we were chatting before the comparison game mm -hmm. you know, women might be i want to be like that other girl or whatever for guys it might be i want to be as athletic as that other guy and mm -hmm. i'm not uncoordinated but i was never particularly athletic and so i've never been that great at golf or a bunch of other things and when i was younger it's like gosh you know i'm just 
um, you know, one of the last people picked for any team on the playground and, you know, the usual thing. And it's like, okay, well, so what? I mean, you know, I have other things that I do well and enjoy. And so there's a temptation to compare ourselves with somebody else. Oh, I wish I was like X person and I'm not. Because when you do the comparison game, your self-worth takes a nosedive. It's okay. You don't have to put the other person down. But it's like, well, that's great that they're athletic or that they're pretty or that they're whatever. Good for them. It's not a competition. You know, I don't have to be the smartest, best looking, most athletic, you know, most successful, most this, most that. I mean, comparison game just erodes your soul. It's not a competition. We're all different. We're all uni very unique. So quit doing the comparison thing. That's another huge thing in my, from my frame of reference. You, you're giving out so much value today. You just gave, you just told people how uh, to unconditionally love others and also, you know, applying that and be less critical on, on ourselves. And now you're just sharing, stop comparing with each other. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'm curious, you know, what's your, what's your vision for crucible leadership? Well, you know, it's funny. It started off about leadership and it still is, but it's really, it's not just for senior executives and for-profit or non-profit. It can be leaders at all levels. It could be community leaders who want to, you know, maybe clean up their neighborhood park and make it safe for kids. It's really, you know, wanting to help anybody with a vision, anybody that wants to come back from challenges, from crucible moments to lead a life of significance. So, you know, leading it at any level, you know, whether it's your community, friends, neighborhood, or in organizations, to help people live lives on purpose, dedicated to serving others. Because to me, that's where true happiness lies. When you have a purpose in life mm -hmm. that aligns with who you are, aligns with your values and your skills. I mean, that, that, I mean who doesn't want a fulfilling life? Who doesn't want, at, on their deathbed, which we'll all get to one day, is you want to feel like, okay, it was a life well lived. You know, I'm proud of what I did. Yeah, I'm not perfect. You know, I have family that love me, you know, kids, grandkids, cousins, friends. And I, you feel like, okay, I lived a life well lived. And um, yeah, I mean, that's that kind of legacy people use. That's the kind of legacy we, we, we want. You don't want to be there saying, uh, I blew it. I wasted my life. Now's the time to make the choice. Not when you're on your deathbed, the clock's run out. So now's the time to, how do you want to live your life? You want to live a full life dedicated to serving others. So that's kind of my vision for Christopher leadership. Mm -hmm. I love that vision. I, I think a lot of the time, a lot of time we're so caught up in our own tragedy, in our own, that moment where we just can't get through things, we just can't pull ourselves together. And, and that we see that as, you know, we're being the victim of that event. And we stay, stay in that place for a very long time. And what really worked well is putting, up, putting yourself out there and start contributing to make a cause for helping others. And that would allow you to see that you are not here alone. And, and what I heard from you um, this morning is that's exactly what you did. You know, you didn't stay in that place. Yes, it took, a, took you a long time, but you didn't stay in that place of being seen yourself as a victim and lost everything. But it, you actually was able to shift your perspective and coming out thinking, well, there's so much strength and talents and self-worth that I can provide to the society. It is. And it's funny, you know, one of the things I, I most love to do is encourage. Um, it probably gives me as much satisfaction as I could think of, whether it's on the boards I've been on or just with other people. And, uh, you know, we have this phrase, if you see something, say something. Mm -hmm. If you see somebody do something good, say something and be specific. You know, I really love you did it, A, because you, you, know, you affected all these people for this reason. People think that, but don't say it. It's, I don't know, it gives me immense satisfaction to be able to encourage people. So, you know, we can all do that. And I, so few people do that. You know they're thinking it, but it's like, say it. If you, if you were really impressed with what somebody did, tell them. It'll bless them and it'll bless you. I mean, it sounds so simple, but it's like, I don't know. It's like finding, you know, diamonds in the rough. I mean, it, so few people do that. They're so concerned with their own lives. 
just think about others and, and say something, see mm-hmm. something, say something. If it's good, if it's bad, you know, maybe not, <laughs> but if it's good, I love, try it. I love, I love, love, love how you inspire everyone on your on your linkedin so guys go follow follow work in on the linkedin he has podcasts beyond the crucible make sure you're subscribed because it's a great podcast and i love 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 everything that you do i just want you to know that well thank you so much and and i love what you, uh, you do you have an inspirational story yourself and your positive attitude your just joy for life that in itself is an inspiration. I know there's many, many people that have that view of you and, and rightly so. So you, you, I mean, I'm not, so, I'm honestly mean this, but you are yourself an inspiration. Just your positive attitude is, yeah, it's, it's um, yeah, it's something we can all learn from. I think, I think, you know, um, the fact that we click, <laughs> you know, really well is that we share the same vision and quality. We see each other. We, we don't just, you know, we see, we see each other. We actually mm-hmm. see each other. Mm-hmm. And I think it's really important. And, and what you do in Crucible Leadership, I think I do see a reflection of how you started the company, how you're running the company, and where you're taking the company going to. And I think it's really important for everyone to hear that when you start a company, it's important to start with that vision, with that purpose. And I can see you being that perfect example of someone who's putting a lot of heart and, and energy into creating a company that you want, you want to let it thrive. You want it to see it grow. And, and by doing so, you're actually helping others to thrive and grow. So I, I, it gives me goosebumps actually just talking about it. <laughs> well... Well, thank you. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's fun. And I think it's growth is good, but it's, you've always got to keep focused on, you know, why am I doing this? Cause you know, there's somebody wrote a book called mission drift. So you always, it's a whole nother discussion, but you always want to make sure why am I doing this and don't, if you want to change your mission, great, but do it consciously, you know, so make sure everything you say yes to everything you say no to is because it reinforces your mission that you think, is somehow going to help others. So that's, yeah. that's very important. So thank you so much for your time. I wanted to wrap this up. And if you were to give, if you were to use one word to, to describe what we need in this world, what is your word? Boy, gee, um, I'm, I, few words is not my gifting, but I'd say things, you know, love, forgiveness, tolerance, Tolerance would be a big one, a little less judgmental of each other, a little more seeking to understand. Um, yeah, it'd be that vicinity. Maybe there's a word for all that, but somewhere in there. <laughs> I love how you gave me three words. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Warwick. It's been a pleasure having you on this morning. You're very inspiring. And where can people find you? Well, uh, they can find me on crucibleleadership.com. I send out regular blogs and podcasts. They can sign up for my blogs and what have you. So yeah, crucibleleadership.com. I'm active on Facebook and uh, LinkedIn uh, under Crucible Leadership or my name, Warwick Fairfax on LinkedIn. So those are probably the best places. And I will have all these in the uh, episode notes so that people can easily find you. And thank you so much for coming this morning. I had a great conversation with someone who I really see as a true leader for all walks of life. And I'm really, really happy that you um, came onto the show. And this is something that people need to hear. Well, thanks so much, Michelle. Wonderful to be here. Yeah. Bye. Bye, everyone. So join me again next Wednesday at 8 o'clock Pacific time at Live Coffee Talk, where I bring you more transformational journey and real life stories where it's going to touch your heart and connect you with actually our life together. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye, Warwick. Bye.